Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us today um, for our roundtable discussion on uh, early lessons for co-development and intergenerational engagement strategies. My name is Nisi Parker. I'm the Youth Engagement Manager at Youth Prize, and I am also your MC for tonight's discussion. Um, we're going to get started by uh, dropping your names and organizations and pronouns into the chat. Um, feel free to rename yourself accordingly so people can put your, your face um, with your name throughout today's talk, you know, get a, get a face to match your name correctly. Um, and I do want to give you guys some time for that. But after you're done, we want to queue a poll up. Uh, Brandy, if you could help us with the poll. And we just want to get a feel for who's in the room today um, and get a feel for where folks are. Uh, yeah, so after you change your name, pronouns, and organizations, um, um, let me know when you're ready, and then we can we can get going on this poll. And we want to just see, like, what role do you play in your community? Um, so, um, so, like, what community change initiatives and what roles are you playing in community change initiatives? So would you consider yourself a youth leader, a systems leader, um, a nonprofit adult leader, a government leader, a funder? or a youth slash adult. Um, let me know when you guys are when you guys are all good. And we'll be able to see um, responses pop up so we can gauge where folks are with responding to the poll in front of you. Hey, Ms. Pamela. Good to see you virtually again. Nice to see you as well. Thank you for doing this for us. And we got a big group here. We got some youth prize folks in the building. And I see folks are, are being added on. So I'm just gonna repeat it just a little bit. Uh, my name is Nisi Parker. I'm the youth engagement manager at Youth Prize. I'm also your MC tonight. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you can go ahead and drop your name, organization, and pronouns into the chat. And also feel free to rename yourself so, so we can address you accordingly. And then also uh, give us an answer on chat on the chat to see where you are and what role you play in community change initiatives. Um, let us know if you can see the poll or if you're having some issues with that too. Oh, Fee, I know Fee. What's up, Fee? No, you. Mm -hmm. Yo. Yo, we got Houston in the house. Ooh, yo, let's see those results. If you're if you're cool, Raven, can we can we see those results pop up? See what we're looking at. Ooh, yo, so a lot of folks identify as nonprofit leaders. We got um, some funders in the house, some youth leaders in the house, system leaders in the house, and some youth and adult. No government leaders in the house. I think, I think we're okay with that though. I think that's all right. Uh, let's let's check out. Let's do another poll real quick. Um, if you guys are down for it, and the second poll is where would you put your program or portfolio strategy development on the youth adult equity ladder? And uh, we got a picture of that ladder. We're gonna we're gonna put that ladder up on 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 the shared screen too, so you guys can see. So if you guys can check out this ladder, it's like eight steps. Um, and you know this is this is you know we can we can like look at like different ways this ladder can look but as it is how would you guys define yourselves um on this scale of one to eight where are you with um uh programmatic and and youth and adult equity in your in your organization there you go
And Raven, I think it's cool once we get to like uh like a 2023 20, number to 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 post those results and see what those results are looking like. Julio, can you guys see those? So we got youth and adult equity is like, it's kind of like that mid range. A lot of us, seems like the majority of us are at that mid range. We got some people in the, in the tokenism who are, are very uh, conscious and aware of themselves and their organization and is, is open and, and, and transparent about that. We think that's super dope. Um, we got some folks who are completely youth driven. That's super dope. And the struggle is real. So I, I appreciate you guys for taking that step forward. Um, yeah, man, I'm excited. Uh, lastly, I want to give you guys an overview of how uh, we're going to spend our time together today. Uh, first, we'll have an overview of KC Foundation strategies. Then we'll do a deeper dive into early lessons learned from our panelists who are super amazing, and you guys will get to know them a little bit better later. And then we'll take some questions from you all before closing with an opportunity uh, to join the next phase of our work. Um, we also have an ongoing Jamboard. If one of you guys could put the Jamboard into the chats for us is to put our thoughts, our ideas, and any questions you may have. We'll circle back to this Jamboard at the end of our conversation um, to get some of those questions answered. Um, and we also have some prompt questions on the slides that can be your thinking partners. And those questions are gonna be looking like, um, what is your experience? Um, from your experience, what does it take to build youth and adult partnerships authentically? Um, what is the most exciting and interesting thing about KC's strategy as we go through that? And any any questions from the strategy that you may have as you as you hear um, the panelists uh, do their amazing talks on this on this work? Um, yeah, and then when we get to the end, we'll answer some of those questions. Does that sound good so far? Any questions? Any questions for me, the greatest person in the world? Any signatures you guys want me to sign? Any autographs you guys want me to hand off? We can hold that to the end too. Um, the the jam board is in the in the, in the board. I'll be taking notes too, um, but definitely feel free to to jump in. Thank you, Fee. Somebody had to say it at some point, um, but I'll I'll take some time to jump in and and add some notes for us. But definitely feel free to get in there and and add your own notes and questions. We really do want those questions. And um, if that sounds perfect, then I'll pass it to Tracy, who's going to lead us in our next section. Thank you, Nisi. You are the number one DJ. I have to absolutely agree with Fee. Um, afternoon, good afternoon, everybody. As Nisi stated, I'm Tracy Brody. I am the senior associate at Annie E. Casey, um, one of the senior associates at the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be with you today. Um, as excited as I am to almost fast forward time a little bit and dive directly into a really robust conversation about um, the work that we've been doing with this intergenerational group of all-stars. Um, I do want to take some time to ground us in our strategic direction as a foundation and with my team, National Community Strategies. So I'm going to spend just a few moments on a quick PowerPoint, then I promise to get into the really fun stuff. Okay. All right. So um, I think it's really important to fast forward time just a little bit. Um, many of you may know uh, back in 2020, the foundation launched our Thrive by 25 strategy. Um, the overarching vision is that young people ages 14 to 24 and their children will have the family connections, the relationships, the communities, um, and the educational and employment opportunities that are necessary for their well being and for their success. Um, and now, we do that, um, that's a big lofty vision and goal. And we do that by focusing um, our investments and support for young people in key areas, five key areas to be exact. Um, and under these five key areas, we have youth leadership, basic needs, education and credentialing, um, financial stability and permanent connections. Uh, as you can imagine, um, Youth leadership is a big portion of that work. And under youth leadership, we also focus on how young people are engaged as leaders in their community. I wanna move uh, just really quickly to talk a little bit more about our philosophy. And Casey um, recognizes that engaging effective communities is really important um, and that partnering with community is really key in advancing 
equity and inclusion goals. Um, we know that working with young people is one of several tools that inform the work and is intended to complement our strategies, not to simply replace them. And so um, we know that there isn't a one size fits all approach to, uh, to youth engagement and our teams internally define what our unique plans are based on our portfolio strategies and our intended results. So it doesn't look the same um, in my particular unit as opposed to if you were in our research and evaluation unit or if you were in our policy reform and advocacy unit, we all kind of take it up in different ways, but the central um, investment area is there in everybody's portfolios. So a little bit, I'll use um, my unit as an example and how that shows up in our investment strategies. Um, I am in our Center for Civic Sites and Community Change. Um, here's our overarching vision and my team, National Community Strategies, our aligned priority areas. We uh, know that for young people and their families to have opportunities, uh, safe jobs, I'm sorry, good jobs, safe and affordable housing, quality schools, need to, they need to thrive and be able to go about their daily lives free of harm and violence. Um, and we kind of try to achieve that vision through housing and community development as a core priority and investment area, community youth, um, community and leadership and engagement and community safety. And you'll see that arrow across the bottom in that advancing race equity and increasing our authentic youth engagement um, and leadership opportunities throughout our portfolio or kind of like undergirds all of our strategies. So last year, I was tasked with developing our community leadership and engagement strategy that was focused on increasing youth engagement specifically. And rather than hanging out in my office and kind of just creating a strategy with a bag of chips and Google in my gut, I decided to lean into our articulated values around engagement. And I knew that collaborating with an intergenerational team of grantees from across our portfolios would not only yield a better strategy, but we were gonna learn some really amazing lessons along the way. And so with that, I started um, an intergenerational learning collaborative that has representation not only from um, the National Community Strategies portfolio, but we pulled some of our grantees from our Baltimore Civic Site and our Atlanta Civic Site as well. So what is uh, the collaborative? So the collaborative has been a and is a multi-phase grantee-centered design process. It's a really cooperative approach to the way we do strategy development, where we're centering young people and youth voice in our strategy and, and how this strategy takes shape um, is not only young people, but also the systems and community leaders that support young people in their efforts. Uh, we see this as an extension of our rights equity and inclusion principles. Um, and again, it's a guiding principle through all of our investments in our unit. Now, the central goal of the collaborative has been not only to um, ensure that communities are safe and strong and what our overarching vision statement was, but to really provide grantees with the support, with the tools that they need to build capacity for intergenerational engagement um, and with a targeted guidance for improving uh, particularly youth engagement. And so we weren't trying to run an adult um, community engagement strategy parallel to a youth engagement strategy, but how are young people and adults in authentic partnership with each other with national level community change initiatives? And where were we seeing um, best practices that we could help um, to scale and amplify through our own influence strategies? So the plan results were to increase our grantees' capacities. Um, to authentically engage with young people um, within these youth adult partnerships, also to expand community and youth engagement resources. What we were seeing out there, there's a plethora of different resources, but they were all geared towards different audiences and um, kind of scattered. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that whatever we were creating was gonna be additive to the field, as opposed to just being one of the same stuff that we were already seeing out there. And then we also, was to create some standard measures for youth engagement across grantees. Um, obviously, Casey is a very data-driven foundation, but we wanted our metrics to be meaningful. We wanted them to not only be meaningful for our board and for our key stakeholders internally, but we wanted them to make sense for our grantees as well. And so we wanted to take the time within this learning collaborative to really unearth what was really important and how to tell that story of how we're moving the needle um, in community. So the way we designed it um, is in 
three phases. The first phase just ended at the end of 2022. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, where it was really about our strategic learning and toolkit co-design. We'll talk a little bit about what that actually means in practice, but we did a lot of listening and learning sessions and Youth Prize came along um, to support us in our design thinking co-design process. Um, the second phase, which kicks off this summer, uh, and we'll talk about that at the end, uh, an invitation for you all to join us. And that is our applied learning phase where we are having an RFP process. We're gonna expand our grantee portfolio and really test the validity of the tools that we are creating in phase one and really refine those tools based on implementation. And then lastly, we're going to be working with our communications team and field leaders to amplify and scale um, the, the community-led intergenerational uh, solutions that we develop in phase one and two. So who do we have around the table? Um, some of the folks I've already seen drop into the, uh, the chat today and are on our panelists, um, are part of our panelists today. And that is Bridges USA, based in Memphis, the Kearns Youth Council, who was one of our evidence success partners um, out in Utah, uh, Yes for Equity, which is a part of the Partnership for Southern Equity, Our Turn, um, which is our, our, one of our um, education justice partners, No Boundaries Coalition, based here in Baltimore, Community Law in Action, CLIA, also here based in Baltimore, doing a lot of amazing things with local policy, um, Point Source Youth and National Youth Homelessness, um, organization doing amazing national work, and then Youth Prize, um, who Nisi is a part of, and Libby, one of our esteemed panelists, will be talking a lot um, today. And Youth Prize, um, it's important to just kind of just talk through, they served as a facilitator and an intermediary for some of our um, phase one activities, and they lead our toolkit creation process, and really have brought um, a depth of their own experience, not only as experts in youth adult partnerships, but also in their design thinking process. So I'm excited to get into that and what that meant for the way we did things differently as a foundation uh, for this particular collaborative. So as I mentioned earlier, we did listening and learning sessions alongside the design thinking process. And we really wanted to focus on six key areas that we really wanted to hear back from both adults and young people that were in our portfolios. We wanted to talk about the community readiness for authentic youth adult partnerships. What did it mean to be ready as a young person to be a part of these tables? What did it mean for your entire community to be ready for this type of project? Um, how do we like measure that? How do we support organizations and figuring out where they are and, and how, that, how that dictates where we come in as a funder and where young people and adults come in as, as stewards of the work. And then um, also talked about the different types of strategies there are for youth engagement and why you might use one strategy versus another, maybe even depending upon your readiness or you know, what your funding strategy may be. Um, we talked a lot about capacity building and technical assistance as a foundation who resources not only with funding, but often um, offers technical assistance. It was important for us to hear back from our grantees about what is most important when getting technical assistance. What are some of the things that we should be thinking about as a foundation? What are some of the key qualities and characteristics of good TA and what type of TA was really integral to moving the needle with these adult partnerships? Um, again, we talked a lot about evaluation, what was meaningful measures for success um, and evaluation and, and data capacity and, and analyzing and all the things that the data nerd in me loves. Um, we talked about youth engagement um, within local policy efforts. Um, talked about local youth commissions. We talked about local um, youth advisory boards that worked with mayor's offices and other systems leaders. And what does that look like to have young people involved in policy creation and policy reform? Um, and then we also lastly talked about our own community um, led and community supported strategy development. What does it mean for Casey to be not just sitting um, sitting on the sidelines, kind of developing strategy in silo, but really listening to community and having our strategies be rooted in community-led solutions. Um, and what does that take from us, for, for us to be able to show up in that way? Um, and how does that change our relationships with grantees along the way? So that's what we really spent a lot of time talking to each individual organization. We had um, intergenerational groups, we had youth-only groups that really dug really deep into that. Um, so again, shout out to Youth Prize for really facilitating that process and, and gathering some amazing, amazing gems that I'm excited to drop in the next section. 
Um, and so the, the end goal, as I said earlier, um, at its core is to develop a toolkit. And that toolkit was to offer um, targeted guidance to increasing youth engagement within intergenerational efforts. Also to not just present, the op, um, present guidance, but to present the cost benefit of the types of um, and ranges of engagement. So yeah, you can say that you wanna be, if we're talking about the youth equity, um, youth adult equity ladder, that you wanna be um, at youth adult equity, but what does that actually take? What's the time that it takes? What are the resources that it takes? What are some of the, um, who, who are your key stakeholders that you need to get buy-in from? Um, all of the things that like aren't necessarily aspirational, like the, the actual nitty gritty of what it takes um, down on paper and presenting that as a part of the toolkit as well to help people really goal set, level set, plan, um, and think about what is actually sustainable uh, for their particular projects in their communities. And then also giving, um, stakeholders action steps to deepen different engagement based on whatever the, the specific priority area is. So earlier I said, like we talked to, to organizations that were doing just different um, work in different systems and different policies and, and how that kind of changes the dynamic, dynamic with youth engagement. So we want it to be a toolkit that is usable um, across, across the board. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I'm over talking about slides now. I'm really excited to get into talking um, to our panelists. Um, and so I'm excited to be talking today to, like I said, an all-star group um, of, of panelists. Um, before we dive into our questions, I wanna give our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves, their names, their pronouns, their organization. And I'll say one thing that they want you all as an audience to know about the way they come to the work. Um, and I am going to start with um, Libby. Awesome, thanks Tracy. <clears throat> Hi everybody, uh, my name is Libby Rao. I'm the Senior Innovation Officer at Youth Prize. Um, Tracy, you gotta remind me, so the next question of how we kind of show up to the work? Yep. One thing I think is important for us to remember and how we try to show up to the work at Youth Prize is just this acknowledgement that um, you know, engaging in intergenerational partnerships and engaging in um, it, that work is like never done. So we come to it with the understanding that this isn't a box to check. This isn't something at the end of the day, you kind of wipe your hands and you're like, oh, I did it. Um, but it's actually, it's an ongoing commitment. And for us, it's an ongoing commitment to do the work better. So that's how we show up. Um, I'm going to pass it. Oh, you, yes. If you could pass it, that'd be great. That takes the pressure off of me. How about Rashad? Hello, everyone. Rashad Staten here. He, him. I'm executive director for community law and action. And one takeaway I would say in the work that we do as far as policy change, um, narrative formation is understanding the value and the expertise of everyone at the collective table, um, that everyone shares this, this, calm hat that we're all experts trying to come to a common understanding. Um, it may be tough, it may be a courageous conversation, but it'll strengthen the space. And from that, learn, take what you get from that space and go and empower and educate someone else um, that the conversation is just not in-house, but you can share it amongst neighbors, collaborators, and other peers in the work. Uh, and I'll pass it to Mahal. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mahal Burr. I'm the director of the Bridges Youth Action Center. Um, yeah, in terms of one thing, one is I love what was already said. I think what I might add to that, because I could have definitely said those two as well, is um, in the, the Youth Action Center, we always say, center your why. If you don't have a strong enough why, if you have a strong enough why, you'll find a how. Um, and it's our belief that youth and adult partnership is not about like, you know, this is really helpful for the future, but like this is key to creating effective, powerful solutions that will make a world that we want to be in. And that's for youth and adults. Um, yeah. And I'll pass it to Milana. Awesome. Uh, I'm Milana Kumar. I use any pronouns. Um, I'm a member of Intercore, uh, Intergenerational Collaborative Organizing for Radical Equity at Bridges in Memphis. 
Um, I think one thing I want everybody to know is that I am coming here. Um, so I'm coming here with the perspective of a youth and also all of the work that I do stems so from like a place of self advocacy. Um, and also just that something that we say here a lot too is that um, I'm not here because I want to help you. I'm here because my liberation is tied to your liberation. Um, and just naming that having a strong like youth and adult partnership is the base for like equity on all fronts. Um, I will pass it to Tyler. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Great afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Tyler Brody. Uh, I work for CLIA, Community Law in Action. Uh, and my boss is here, Rashad Stanton. Uh, spotlight to him. I would just echo the same sentiments that he has spoken, but I think uh, for me, as being a youth advocacy trainer or the program assistant, is to highlight uh, that at the end of the day that we have created a covenant or promise with the community, and that is to alter and to shape uh, not just for the benefit for the future of those who we're serving, but for us as well. Uh, and that's the one thing that I would say. Um, I would pass it to Nisi. Sure. Um, my name is Nisi Parker again. I'm the youth engagement manager. I'm an MC. I think I might like jump in and out of this conversation a little bit um, as questions are being answered, but um, I'm really approaching this work um, through a context of um, I do have an obligation to, uh, I believe we all have an obligation to make this world a little bit better um, before we leave by the time, um, from the time that we came in. So this is, this is um, all the work that we do is really important to me in terms of, of holding my duty as a, as a, as a member to the society and doing what needs to be done, you know what I mean? So, and I'll pass it back to Tracy. All right, um, so excited to have this conversation because I actually know these guys and I'm, I'm just super, super excited for you all to get to know the work that we have been doing as a collective. Um, so, okay, um, I know I mentioned in earlier slides that uh, Youth Prize served as an intermediary of sorts and a facil facilitator of our phase one activities. Um, one of the lessons learned that the foundation holds from previous projects is the importance and value of bringing in outside organizations to support our work. One, it helps to mitigate power dynamics that often exist between foundations and grantees, but also that intermediaries can often bring in a specialized skill set that deepens engagement and outcomes. Um, in this case, we work through Youth Prize, a, a, a nonprofit that is based in Minnesota, not only to leverage their expertise in youth adult partnerships but bring in the design thinking process to our intergenerational strategy development. So I'm gonna kick us off with a question to Libby, um, because if you are anything like me, um, I, you need a walkthrough. Um, so Libby, can you walk us through what the design thinking process is and why this approach works particularly well for learning collaboratives like Casey's? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So just a little bit about the design thinking process and kind of what it is. Um, it's a, it's a nonlinear, process. It's very collaborative. Um, if you need kind of, if you're a visual person, I always kind of visualize a figure eight um, with these different phases that we walk through um, within the process. It's really a creative problem solving method that the, what I think is the most important part of it is that it really centers those, those most impacted by either the product or the service or the program that we're designing. They're at the center of it. Um, and then built in are kind of these natural spaces for a lot of reflection, a lot of learning, and it allows for kind of quick changes um, as you go along the process. So we're not waiting for it to get done. We're not looking for kind of this final draft. Um, we're making those changes and edits as we go. So that's where that kind of figure eight, that weaving back and forth of these phases really comes in. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but just so you have some context for what those phases are, there's, there's a few of them. So what the first one we usually start with is empathy. And that's really connecting um, with, again, the folks that are most impacted. So you saw on Tracy's slide, she talked a lot about our listening and learning sessions. Uh, we spent most of the year engaging in those listening and learning sessions to really understand how people see the issue, what their needs are, how um, intergenerational work is showing up in community. So we spend a lot of time in that empathy phase. The second phase um, is really defining. And as Mahal said too, it's not just defining like the what we wanna do, but it's defining the why and being really clear about that as we move through the process. 
Um, then there's phases along the way that are really about idea generating, getting those big ideas on the table, looking at what some of those small ideas are, but might have big impact, um, getting that all on the table so that we can kind of um, filter for the good ones um, and figure out what we want to do and where we want to move. Um, and then it, there's a prototyping phase, and that's really building out these ideas, building models, again, so that we can have that quick change and make adjustments as we go. And then we test it and see how it's working in community and go back and forth between these phases. So gathering more empathy and insights after we create a tool or create a model that we're looking at, we've created a series of frameworks for the toolkit that we've then went back and got more um, input um, along the way. So those phases really quickly are empathy, defining, idea generating, prototyping, and testing. So the, the process is, is usually the same, but sometimes the products and the programs show up differently. So like at YouthPrize, um, we've used this in a variety of different ways. We've used it to create an RFP for funding opportunities. Um, we've used it with communities across the US to reimagine after school programming. Um, we've used it with large nonprofits to look at their recruitment strategies for volunteers. Um, so the, again, the products can be different, but the process tends to be the same. And I think that's important, um, again, to go back to that why, like why we use design thinking maybe over a different process. Um, and we use it because we really feel that it is the power sharing model. So when we come into partnerships like this and we come into the collaborative, we don't have a prescribed solution or kind of this preconceived notion of what we think the community needs and wants. What we do come in and with though is this process that will help us collaborate and really co-create something together. And I will say it is fun, it can be a little messy, um, but it, there's a lot of collaboration and a lot of room for creativity. Um, and I think why it's worked really well, specifically with our um, learning collaborative is that all of the participants have come into the project really from different levels of understanding intergenerational work and different levels of practice. Some came in with like really strong expertise. They've been doing this work for a really long time. And some folks were really new to the idea and some of these concepts that we were talking about. Um, the Learning Collaborative is also spread across the US. So everyone's coming, from, coming to the table with different community contexts. Like this work shows up very differently in Baltimore than it shows up in Utah. And so bringing all of that together in the design process is like, is the coolest part. It's really about working across differences and being able to use this process um, to build the toolkit, not only by folks, but the folks that will actually end up being using it will also be coming from these different places and spaces. Um, and so the product is important. Um, you know, we're going to create this really cool toolkit. We've got some really great models and prototypes that are already in the works. Um, and the product's important. We know that that's at the center of this. Um, but equally important is the process and how we get there. And so we really feel like the design work um, and the design process allows for that power sharing, that collaboration, that real creative sense. Um, and I will say the, the unique thing also about this project is that we're also modeling intergenerational partnerships through the work. So the learning community is really made is made up of young people um, and adults. And we've been using really core principles and a lot of the best practices around intergenerational relationships to actually build the tool itself. And the design process really allows for that space. So I'll kind of stop there. I know that's kind of a lot. Um, but any questions drop in the chat too and some resources too that we can share if you want to know a little bit more about the technical side of it. But yeah, I know from the foundation's perspective, it was the first time that I'd heard about the design thinking process and was really interested in, in doing more with it. Um, but I do think that it takes a certain level of comfort um, in like getting messy and understanding and being not just understanding, but embracing that the mess turns into a masterpiece. And how do you like trust that process? Um, again, like it's, it's just not linear. That figure eight can be a little... Um, for, for organizations that are used to a very, very like A to Z process, um, it can be a little jarring, but it, it really has been an amazing learning opportunity for us. Um, I wonder from the folks who were um, on the panel that experienced being a, a user on the user end of the design thinking process, how did this process feel different for you all than other projects that you had been a part of um, before? And anybody can take that question. 
I can jump in. Um, so one thing I'll say about the design process that I really appreciate it is how it truly, I think, let me name this, but it truly embodied the principles that we were looking to create. If we're going to create something that's intergenerational, something that truly builds authentic intergenerational partnership, you all need it to embody that. Um, and both the best practices for creating a space where both folks feel like they can talk, but also it was co-facilitated with youth and adults as facilitators. Um, and I think that created a different atmosphere too. Yeah, I'll go. Um, Rashad here, clear, build off of what Mahal has said. I, I think um, what was impressionable for me during that design thinking process was the space giving for us to collectively define what the terms were together um, oftentimes you're giving something with a blanket statement and it is forced upon you to take it as truth um, through this design thinking certain terminologies that is most common in this space we all had to come to some agreements with it um, and that was across both youth and adults right so it was coming back reframing um, changing up the definitive to be inclusive of everyone's different perspectives being representative across the country um, different ages ethnicities and all Right. One common because we see the, the sky is blue does not mean it's blue to everyone. Right. So it came to a space of like humility um, and also in that space of um, the age continuing the spectrum. Although it's an adult and youth collaborative intergenerational space, being mindful that sometimes you must separate to build a space of accountability that didn't come back to together. I think that was refreshing. Uh, because you don't often see that it's oftentimes we try to force everyone in the room to come to an agreement when sometimes we have to have these very um, courageous conversations amongst age group to maintain safe space to then come back and say, all right, let's come back together as a collective. Uh, from my, my vantage point, I thought that was refreshing and, and impressionable. Yeah, yeah. Um, ditto to everything that was just said. I really um, I can't say enough about the process. Um, and thank you to Youth Prize for, for lending your expertise and allowing us the um, opportunity to experience it. Um, when we first started to think about the toolkit um, and the audience for the toolkit, uh, we were really thinking about adult systems leaders. Um, and as we began to listen to our grantees and the young people and adults around the table, it became very clear that our initial thinking was way too narrow. Um, we learned really quickly that uh, what grantees really needed or felt was needed within their communities was a truly intergenerational toolkit with resources for adults, for young people, and for organizations and partnerships. And that those resources needed to be able to be adapted to local need. Um, and we weren't, we didn't need to develop a one size fits all approach. Rather, we needed to provide a general framework with a suite of different resources to, support communities and moving the needle based on their own readiness and their overarching goal. Um, so that was a really big, very quick lesson that we learned. Um, Mahal, this question is for you. Um, we know that Bridges um, has worked with partners in Memphis to develop toolkits in the past. And my question is, based on your experiences, um, why is the intergenerational adaptable toolkit the right direction for Casey and the Learning Collaborative? Thank you, Tracy. Um, yeah, you know, earlier you said that, you know, you could have been in a room and created something, but you went into this process of truly making it with youth and adults. And that's what we did in phase one. Um, I think that was essential because you just can't create youth and adult partnership that will be effective and authentic without youth and adult creating the plan together for that partnership. Um, so basically, um, yeah, you, you definitely, like, there's a huge power dynamic, right, between youth and adults, and if we create a toolkit that can only be used by adults, or that's meant for adults to create youth and adult partnership, that won't work. That's, that's not even, that's ridiculous. Um, so we should definitely center the insights of young people. Um, who have not been at the table in creating the plan for how youth and adult partnership will work. I'm kind of leaning into that idea of nothing about us without us. Um, so intergenerational key, that is 
because if we're going to create intergenerational partnership, we have got to create a toolkit that lends itself to both youth and adults working together to create the plan. And then adaptive, that is super key. Um, in our work in Memphis, we have worked with a huge number of different groups around um, creating youth and adult partnership. And in each of those, um, you know, we came in with lots of resources and we found that different ones worked for different groups. Um, and that while, you know, this, and we were able to find, we were able to learn in those spaces, things that we would have never thought of um, because kind of leaning into that idea, nothing about us without us, um, the people who are directly affected, the folks who are from the community, from the organization have insight that, you know, um, no foundation or no organization um, can like contain. I think, yeah, so I would just add to that, like, um, I think we found that every time that we have, we have made mistakes and tried like a cookie cutter approach to things that has never worked. Um, so creating instead a toolkit that's more like almost a buffet of like here are different options and then working collaboratively with the partner to figure out what's the best model um, is, is truly key to make this work. Yeah, um, absolutely, absolutely agree with you. Um, another question, just while we're talking to Bridges, um, as I mentioned in the earlier slides, capacity building and technical assistance was a key area of interest within our listening and learning sessions. And one of our key takeaways was the importance of TA providers being representative of the communities that they're supporting. Um, that being said, Bridges was selected recently to serve as a TA provider for our phase two activity. Now, um, as nonprofit leaders, um, many of us have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of TA and capacity building efforts. Um, my question is to the Bridges team, and that is, what is Bridges most looking forward to as they step into the TA role for phase two participants and grantees? Uh, I can start that one off. Um, I think having been a part of Authentic Youth and Adult Partnership from the youth side, um, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing similar foundations and the work that can spring off of that being built nationally. Um, and also looking forward to the like transformative nature of this process. Um, like Libby said, that figure eight and the like give and take of it and also bringing all of the insight that I find back to um, Bridges. Um, and also just, yeah, just getting insight experience and um, knowledge that I wouldn't have had before and a transformative dialogue with other folks. Um, and I'm also intrigued by exploring the adaptability of the toolkit um, and just meeting different people where they are and seeing how how that transformation differs um, among orgs. Mahal, if you want to add anything. Yeah, um, you know, when we as the Youth Action Center initially came together, we had this um, like visioning session and we envisioned a world where all decisions that affect young people included them at the decision making table um, in both the planning, implementation, evaluation. So I'm really excited about working nationally with partners to build that um, in other cities and also to create this national tool that can be used to transform, you know, how organizations work that make decisions that affect youth across the country. Um, and then I'm also just, I'm excited to uh, work with these organizations, learn, just like uh, Milana said. Mm. Yeah, I think the typical TA structure is that adults are coaching other adults on how to do this work. <laughs> um, and so we're really excited to be um, investing in a strategy where young people are a part of the TA team. Um, and so I guess my question is to the group, what does it mean to have young people involved on a level as far as TA and support that isn't the status quo when it comes to the field? And anyone can answer that one. Well, I would just say for me, um, just working for CLIA and having both uh, hats to wear, uh, that um, I am also a youth, but I'm also an adult like worker, if you will. So I have to realize and understand that I'm not just speaking from a level of intelligentsia, but I'm also speaking from a place of I have to like 
welcome the fact that you're not just saying this for yourself and that there's not a level that any conversation can't go to that you're not going to welcome that that in I guess for me um and I guess like I just had to learn that it's all about transparency and empathy yeah I'll, I'll pick up from uh, where Tyler is um being clear ourselves and Tyler being our youth advocacy trainer at the age that he would be con doesn't designate or consider the youth um as being the executive director and intentionally placing him to be our youth advocacy trainer to be that outward facing person now um when we go to clear it's already um positioning young people at the forefront as experts right um you'll have a room of 50 to 25 and then you'll have a youth adult staff personnel leading them around conversations that is about youth and how to connect with adults so it changes that dynamic in the space in itself that even these questions these pointers um, and the content that we're facilitating um, at clear on our technical assistance and professional development and capacity building workshops that we do as thought leaders um, our content is co-developed by young people themselves Right, so we uh, we have content where the young people is giving their own narrative, their own lived experience. They're asking these thought provoking questions that then um, causes adults to go into breakout questions and then come back, and that makes them to think of it. Our young people are sharing lived experiences and a multitude of different experiences um, to these one different scenarios, or we have them have different definitives of how a young person may use one person, one type of language versus how an adult receives it. And it shows the miscommunication, right, between gaps and cultural significance and things of that sort. And by the time we leave out there, uh, most and all the times, it's um, an act for us to come back or to do another deep dive, right? Um, and they always say, man, this is refreshing because this is one of our first times or few times that we actually got to hear from young people about young people. And for us on that end, it's like, why is this not the norm? But even going through this opportunity itself, we're creating this space that um, the disback practice will become the normality of how to do it. And what um, Mahal always say, nothing about us without us. So us empowering and positioning our youth leaders to be our lead facilitators um, is showcasing it in itself. It's just not talk, but it's action. Mm. Yeah, I like that. That was a great way of kind of summing summing that up. Um, I want to think about, as I think about while I was reviewing the lessons learned in preparation for this conversation, I came across little gems that um, I wanted to share and or get more insight into. And so the following statement is one that I'm interested in hearing multiple perspectives on, and that is um, one of the key things that came up was this statement. Um, connectivity rather than resources is a significant gap in youth adult, I'm sorry, in youth engagement efforts. I'll repeat that. Connectivity rather than resources is a significant gap in youth engagement efforts. Um, can we talk just a little bit about what that means in practice? What are those connections or connectivity and, and how are those um, connections uh, forged? Yeah, I can start that off. Um, I, I just think that's extremely powerful. I think the key to connectivity is recognizing um, and intentionally working through power dynamics. Um, and the key to working through those power dynamics is building an intentional foundation of relationship building and community agreements and norms that centers rather than like avoiding conversations about power dynamics in the space. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate you naming that. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I can add, um, I think that intergenerational relationship building is generally overlooked as like a first step uh, to establish a partnership between youth and adults. Um, and like Mahal mentioned, trust can't be built without first mitigating any power dynamics present um, and recognizing intersectionality of identities and how everyone's identities, both marginalized and mainstream, impact how they show up in the space. Um, and dismantling those dynamics in practice looks like, uh, like Rashad said earlier, like having those difficult conversations. Um, and like Tyler said, like pushing yourself to those uncomfortable boundaries, um, because simply put, conflict causes change. And without pushing those boundaries and getting to that uncomfortable place, um, those power dynamics are always going to exist and impact the work um, and authentic partnership. 
And I would just add kind of from, you know, at Youth Prize, we, we are an intermediary, so we do some, um, you know, we do funding as well. And so I think from this funder perspective, I think when I look at that statement, connectivity rather than resources is a significant gap in the youth engagement effort. I think we need to look at, but as a funder, how are we resourcing that connectivity? Right. If they're saying that if, if the young people and through the listening and learning sessions, we were learning that that's like that's the gap. Is I think the, the conversation for that I would challenge us as funders would be to really look at um, how are we resourcing organizations and individuals to really carve out time and space for folks to actually create the conditions that are right so that we can build these intergenerational and, and generational relationships and work on that connectivity. So I think there, there. I think the importance of the the connections and the relationships are really, like, often overlooked when we're talking about deliverables and grant agreements. Um, but it's essential, right? And I think for us as funders to really look at how are we providing resources that's funding the specific relationship building. So whether that's activities within programs or projects, how are we encouraging folks to use paid time to be able to build that connect those connections? You know, how are we looking at um, the funds and designating funds for specific events or specific activities that bring people together to really forge those connections that we're saying are so essential. And so I think in the statement they're saying they're saying that the resources aren't the gap, but it's the, you know, the connectivities at the center. And I would challenge us to think that it, that both, how do these come together so that we're really prioritizing it um, and putting some resources behind it because we are saying they're important. Mm -hmm. um, and not just assuming that it's part of the work um, and that, you know, well, that it has to happen and we think it's important, but then let's put some, let's put some resources behind it to ensure that it can. Yeah. And, and, and monetary resources and also the luxury of time, right? Like how are we building the time in when we think about how quickly, like, we know that change happens at the speed of trust and it takes relationship building to get to that trust. And so how are we being as flexible as we can? Um, and mindful about the type of time it takes in order for, for this change um, to not just happen, but to be sustainable. Um, um, so yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that perspective um, from the funding standpoint. It is so, so important that, um, that we're using our um, influence in a positive way and that we're granting people not only the dollars, but the grace um, that it takes in order to get this work done and get this work done well. Um, Another kind of question around how funding <laughs> shows up um, in it. We talked about measuring success. I know earlier I talked about us wanting to get to where, you know, our metrics for success mirrored what community thinks metrics for success are and that, you know, we're thinking about data burden, but we're also like collecting the information that we need to make sure that, you know, we're moving the needles. Um, and so one of the conversations that was had during the listening and learning sessions, we were talking about how youth and adults come to a consensus on the why behind programs and under, and have a really clear understanding of what success truly looks like. Um, and that seems pretty straightforward, but here's my question. How should partnerships approach consensus building if and when you have a stakeholder, like a funder, a systems leader, that has a totally different idea of what success looks like? Um, it's almost like I think it was Rashad earlier that said that, you know, people come in with like certain definitions and we took the time within this collaborative to kind of build our own definitions. But what do you do when the person that holds the most power isn't necessarily at that consensus building table? Um, how, how should partnerships approach consensus building, particularly partnerships that are youth adult based partnerships? I can I can start with that one, you know. I think um, you know whether it's funders or systems leaders, um, community. I think we need all of those perspectives at the table. You know um, that we need we do need funder insights. We do need community experience and expertise. I think typically in some of my work, um, it's either been very funder driven or it's been very community driven, um, and I think we need both to like really understand what that landscape is. Um, but I would say that for me, the scale tips towards community and that um, as funders, we do need to believe in community. We need to trust community. And our, our role in that space is to respond to it. So. I'll take, I'll take a, a jab at it as well. Um, I think Libby's right on. Um, I always say all perspectives are equally important. 
Um, and with that being said, I think none of the work can be done in silos, right? Um, the work from the grassroots level cannot be propelled or sustainable without the funding um, and the proper allocation that is coming from, I, I call it the top of the castle, right? Um, but so with that being said, we always be mindful of their priorities, right? I think the open door policy relationship of being transparent um, with your funders and those that are actually pro providing some type of capital to you, your initiative has to say, I, I, I hear your priority, but this priority may or may not translate well to the communities that I serve and how I show up with it. So I'm going to try to uh, somewhat complement your priority, but uh, give me the space to change um, my methodology, my lens of engagement. And as well as when it's time for me to share back, allow it to be in my language. Um, that allows them to, we honor the voices of those that we're servicing, but it's also honoring the priorities and how it has been, um, I wanna say prioritize or listed out from the top down to the bottom. Um, also what we do in that space is we are clear, we are very adamant on being strength-based and asset-based. Um, regardless of when we're answering to our RFP and things of that sort, we always respond back in strength-based and asset because we are so mindful that we're trying to not just change our young people in the world around us, the all stakeholders that have some type of connectivity needs to be changed. So even if we do win or we don't win, you read it now, RFP in a, such of a language may be an eye opener for you. And that's our way of coming into that system to, to, to teach up versus having to always be a, a top-down approach. Um, and then when we do our programming, we collect um, and we honor our young people's voice by allowing them to construct um, and formulate our data report that we're going to share back out externally. Our young people are hosting empathy interviews. They are hosting peer-to-peer -peer conversations. Um, we capture their journals as qualitative data points. Um, we hear from our partners, and then we formulate it that you'll hear all these different vantage points to come back up. And it's hard for anyone to ignore five different um impressionable reflections of somebody from a strength-based place when it's actually showing the actual work. So it all plays its part. Um, I can go on and on, but my colleagues all have great pointers that we've learned from um, throughout time together. So I'll pass it on to someone else. Um, I'm actually going in the interest of time to move to the next question because I do want to get to questions that um, have been posed in the chat and on the Jamboard. Um, so the closing question that I will ask um, is this. Um, we heard a lot about adult and systems leaders being open to changing their attitudes and behaviors and learning and sharing decision-making um, and, and, and their own knowledge with young people. We also heard a lot about, you know, the importance of building trusting relationships being really essential to creating this um, supportive ecosystem within community change initiatives. And so I wanted to end today's, like, not the whole conversation, but this portion of kind of planned questions around this, like, what does it take to, to develop, to create a supportive ecosystem for community change initiatives? What does that supportive ecosystem look like, feel like? Um, what do I hear and feel in those spaces? Um, and so I will take any perspectives that folks have on what does it take to create that supportive ecosystem? Um. I think a lot of creating that ecosystem for youth leadership comes from, like we've mentioned before, mitigating and dismantling power dynamics, um, both internalized and other things that take form of external bias um, and any other power dynamics to support youth finding their own power and being able to, like I said, for myself, at least, I've had a journey of like self-advocacy and being able to advocate for myself in oppressive spaces. Um, and so helping youth find that in themselves um, and I think another thing is meeting youth where they are, um, similar to this toolkit, how we're like meeting grantees in different spaces of youth and adult equity. equity. Um, different youth are going to be in different places of either knowing how to advocate for themselves or just in general, um, situations vary. Uh, so I think a lot of that has to do with recognizing capacity, uh, adapting to it. Um, and then I think that that can be done through creating community norms and community agreements that everybody has come to consensus on upholding, because um, that's able to sort of shift the power dynamic with adults and system leaders um, who come into their space by letting the youth set the precedent for what their environment should look like, um, as opposed to just being subject to one created without their voice. Yeah, um, and I'll just add on a little bit to what Milana said. Um, I think one of the 
one of the struggles that we've sometimes come up against to creating a supportive ecosystem is I'd say every group we've worked with, we've worked with adults who are like, I want this space to be a space that is inclusive of young people. We've worked with a lot of people who said that, maybe not everyone, but a lot of people who are like, I want young people at the table. And then they think it's just gonna happen, right? They, they're like, okay, maybe we can do one training and then it's gonna happen. But the truth is, um, like Milana was saying, you have to dismantle, like, you have to dismantle all those power dynamics. And there, uh, when we started, we started with that ladder and y'all named where you are. I think if you also thought about where have you experienced the most, it's very low on the ladder. Um, and so that's what we're used to. That's what we do, what we know. We do what we know, especially when we're stressed. So it's not about like a one-time solution or one-time training. It's about like truly recognizing that we have internalized depression, internalized idea of where youth should be and where adults should be. We have um, created a system that really works for adults to be successful. And we got to completely change that system. Um, we got to change how we run meetings. We got to change when we meet. Um, all those little details that honestly, I think if adults are just at the table, they'll never even think of all of them because we're kind of blind to um, all the ways in which the system is set up for us. And that's another reason why in order to create that supportive ecosystem, we've got to create it with young people. Yeah, and if, if you don't mind, Mahal, I'll piggyback off of that one a little bit. And thinking about meeting young people where they're at, um, a lot of times as like these organizations, we ask young people to show up, we ask them to be engaged, and um, we we ask them to kind of leave their, their other things behind and like kind of focus on us for a bit. But what does it look like to meet them where they at and provide holistic support for where they are? Um, a lot of times I see organizations asking young people to show up and these young people have lived experience, right? So um, imagining young people who are dealing with houselessness, young people who are dealing with being single parents, young people who are dealing with mental health and all these other levels, right? So how do we support them mentally, emotionally, um, financially, and, and build those relationships to do that, but also put the backing and the financial backing behind supporting young people holistically um, what does it look like if a young person is battling with transportation and, and, you know, we as organizations have this relatively large budget compared to what they're able to work with? How do we uh, provide resources to, to protect them and, and to help them so they can show up as their full selves and they can show up in a way that is meaningful um, um, and not in that uh, scientific survival mode where the the brain that we're asking them the part of the brain we're asking them to access is not even accessible because they're literally working in a different side of their brain in order to to make it in this in this cold world so um i think holistic support and and having some financial backings to that um mean a lot to that ecosystem of support if i may but I'm throwing this to Tyler for alley oop as well. Um, when Tyler does his facilitation, the first question he asks is, are you ready to be an active listener? And then he asks the adults to find active listening because that's what we heard from our young people. Like most of the time, they're just asking us questions so that they can respond in the moment versus listening to what I'm really saying, despite if I had the right words to express how I'm really feeling. So he takes them through this, um, and then we go through this equity-based questionnaire that's about 19 questions, and it's really in-depth that makes you really look at yourself as an adult. Um, and then in my space as executive director, um, I always make it clear to any adults in a space that requests or asks of young people's representation, I always say, are you willing um, to take away the letters before and after your name, discredit your years of education for a young person? that's probably just as old as your years of educational work experience to tell you that you don't know what you're doing. Could you sit in that moment without being offensive, without getting offended, without things of that sort? And if you're not, and if you don't have that heart and mind work, you may not be ready to bring a young person in because you're not ready to deal with your own reality. 
Yeah. That that is all uh, that I was going to say. So sad. <laughs> but I think for me, it's just at the end of the day, it's clearly and holistically as what Nisi and all of you have said uh, that this is all about process and we're walking this together. Uh, and my mentor, other than Rashad, he always says every room that you're in or every place that you belong on or every conversation, you have nothing to prove, but everything to share. And I think that is what we have to highlight, that every conversation, whether it's about partnerships or systems or creating institutions or whatever it may be, that this is about sharing not just our testimony, but also sharing that we will get through this together and really understanding that it takes all of us to progress. Um, and um, I don't know, I just, for me, it's just at the end of the day. Uh, I don't want to keep walking and continuing this work without noticing that I've made a difference some way, somehow, uh, that I cannot just be in every room or be a part of the photo op, noting that there's no process or no progress that has been done, that I'm just doing it for any reason. Another gem has been dropped. Um, I just wrote that down. Nothing to prove, but everything to share. I think that's so important for um, even when I think about you know, professionals that have imposter syndrome when they walk into spaces. Um, that just seems like such a good kind of quote to keep front and center um, and everything to share. I'm gonna marinate on that. Um, I do wanna pause um, for a second and give us um, some time to, to shift over to the Jamboard. I know Karen asked a few um, really great questions that we want to get to. Um, Nisi, can you pull up on your end? You don't have to pull up the whole Jamboard, but if you can just show like read out some of the questions that we want to make sure that we get to? No doubt. So our first question is, um, was equal balance given to adults and youth in the go forward plan for the toolkit? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll take the first kind of um go around with the question and I'm really interested on other folks' um, perspective. I think one of the most important things that Youth Prize had us do as a foundation was to create a container for the project. So being really clear about exactly what we were asking for, um, what was fixed and what was flexible. So it wasn't like, we knew that we wanted to create a toolkit. Um, we didn't know what we wanted it to look like, but we knew it, it had to be like a Casey branded toolkit. And when it like comes to certain Casey branding, that means certain things. And so we had to sit down and say like, you know, it has to go be able to go through our communications channels. It has to be able to like, be able to stand up on its own and not need $500,000 worth of TA support every year. Um, and so we were able to, I think, create the conditions um, that, were favorable for us to say outside of these things like this is a pretty open um open process and so I think that we did a really good job of breakouts that were both like youth breakouts and adult breakouts and when I look at what we're coming up with even now our, our team like we did the initial um round with the full group and now we're in like a more intensive design process that is still intergenerational. We had the folks um, from Bridges and Youth Prize and CLIA in our space here in Baltimore two weeks ago where we were hashing out like what are definitions of ageism versus adultism and how does that show up in the toolkit? And so I would say equal balance is like it, it's taking longer because equal balance is given to those perspectives. Um, but that is just my my perspective as the lead from the foundation on the project. I would love to hear um, how other folks are feeling like it's landing. I will say one thing that we had not thought about, which is a huge piece now, is the fact that it needed to be, um, um, oh my gosh, where's the word? You know, and not interactive. What's the word I'm looking for, Libby? Multimedia, multimedia. Um, so we wanted it to be, they were like, no, this has to be multimedia. Like this can't be a PDF. Like that's that's not gonna work for young people. And I was like, oh yeah, y'all are right. I'm tired of printing out a 75 page toolkit, right? And, and there were times when we were in the process where 
um, we would be talking about something and Mahal would say, I'm going to share this, this mini like video that's 45 seconds that will give us the meaning of adultism, right? Or, or a different perspective on adultism. And like, I'm like, yeah, that one minute video summed up what a 45 minute conversation may sound like. And so um, things like, like that we weren't initially thinking about, I don't think Casey has ever done a multimedia toolkit. Um, this will, after we beta test the resources um, and we, we go to amplification and scale phase, it will be multimedia. There'll be videos, there'll be, it'll be accessible, um, particularly because we do want it to be truly intergenerational and nobody is walking around with binders of toolkits anymore. It's just like not a thing. I love that, Tracy. Thank you so much for elevating that multimedia approach. I think that that's super important. At Point Source Youth, we're also trying to move away from a PDF only version and something that has been super helpful for us as well that we're trying to explore is how to also make it interactive right as a way because we also know that learning and people access information in different ways so i love the videos as well as ways to interact and then also thinking about how can folks provide immediate feedback was this helpful what was missing do we feel like it was youth centered so maybe also including options for folks to provide quick and immediate feedback so that folks who are facilitating that process can really modify in real time I think it could be super helpful as well. Thanks for that, Andrew. I think that as we are, and we'll talk about this in a few moments, as we're talking about like the communities that will pilot the toolkit, getting that feedback loop is going to be really, really important. Um, um, not just for like facilitating certain activities, but just like how long did that take? I mean, we might have something that we think is going to take two sessions, but to Libby's point around design thinking, it's going to be the same. It might be a figure eight where you have to go back to that dismantling adultism training three, four or five times before you really get it embedded into the culture um, and really understanding from our perspective, like what are the iterations that this needs to go through in order for us to get it right, which is why this piloting phase is so crucial to, to the entire process. Julio, if you guys are down, I can jump to the next question. Mm -hmm. Julio, what does success look like for you all? Let me check that one out. Um, so I, I actually, as part of our time together when we first met, when we got together in Baltimore not too long ago, um, we kind of thought about this question and we drew this picture and it had, or I'm very visual, but I drew a picture and it had like the TAs, technical assistants walking away and the um, and the, the site being like, we got this. Um, we, we don't need y'all. <laughs> we love y'all, but we don't need y'all. Um, I think for us, it looks like this, we, that this is something that can live on its own that folks leave feeling like this is sustainable. This is something that I can do in a way that feels healthy. And I have a support system um, of people who are also doing this work. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's really key to, to us. And I think another place that looks is, um, is that this toolkit is something that is stronger by the end. Um, I think we're gonna come in and we are, this is not going to be like, oh, we have the answers. It's going to be like, we're creating something even better by the end of it. I think there's two pieces. Anyone else have anything to add? Um, success to me um, looks like the reality that this, with this toolkit we'll provide, it's not just a checklist, right? It's not another metrics that we in our respective work has to do, but it becomes a way of life. Right. Um, it shows up in our, our mentality. It shows up in how we meet. It shows up in our conversation. It shows up in the relationships that you build with the young person and watching them to further develop themselves and to grow larger than the space that you created for them. Right. It's creating a space where you can literally give them a sense of um, 
self-identity and allow them to define their own success when you yet are blown away with what they come up with to define it, right? Um, it's showing up in the space of, of success to us is, and it shows up every day. I tell them the biggest um, data point that Clear can offer is that three of our former youth leaders are now staff, right? So when someone says that, it's like, look at my, look at the work of our organization leading the organization. Uh, and that speaks to itself. That shows the continuum and the respectability of it. And I think um, that our organizations here are not just the sole thought leaders and the expert, but when we go and we bump shoulders with others, we all have this common understanding. And I think that's when we start to see the work. It can't just be a buzzword and something that's um, valuable at the moment because it's it's reflective of our world. It's the first time in our history in the world where multi-generations share a space in school, career, recreations, social, and things of that sort. So why not the social sectors of how we all interconnect is not already a common understanding. Once it becomes a common way of life versus a checklist, then we know we have our longstanding impact. Mm -hmm. I, Tracy, mm -hmm. go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, I agree with Rashad completely and that there's no way to quantify success um, in this situation. And that a lot of the times it's more so visible through relationships and the shift in environment that you can see. Um, and I think another, I think more youth centered approach to viewing success is on the grantee level, are youth choosing to continue participating? Um, and like, I feel like shifting your view to look at youth comfortability in the space too. Tracy. Yeah, um, I was gonna say something similar um, to you, Milana, but like from the funding perspective, I think it's really important for us to do a temperature check, like when it comes to success, that we are continuously embodying the principles that we are putting into the toolkit. Um, so it, I think it is going to be really important for us to have deepened our relationship and our credibility with grantees when it comes to this work. Um, and not that we are, you know, putting out tools to help other people do something that we're not doing ourselves. And so it's really, it's been, uh, I've been really fortunate to be a part of our internal learning agenda around youth engagement at the same time as we are doing this learning collaborative. And I see so much um, growth and learning um, across the board. And so seeing that learning actually be embodied in the principles um, and values of the foundation, um, if we can just keep that, um, I think that that's a huge marker of success is that we continue to, to embody that along the way. Julio, so we got one question that's already in the chat and then we got a couple questions on cue. Um, I saw one that I really wanted to answer. Um, it was like, and I'll do it really, really quickly. Um, and it is like, as Casey continues to grow in this work and to be more invested in resourcing organizations to build these relationships, are there plans to grow similar interest and appetite with funders? The question is soon come, yes. Um, I think that as a national foundation that, that has like peer that are, are part of, I can't even count countless funder tables. Um, and we have to think about our own influence and our influence strategies. And so I'm a part of, within my own portfolio, four to five funder collaboratives that we talk about this work all the time and not just talk about it, but share resources. And so I see this as an opportunity, not only to share resources, but also to share the work that we have to do as a foundation. Um, it's like a two-way learning opportunity. Like, again, not just what it takes for community to take this up, but what, what does the foundation need? Um, what are the conditions and assumptions that we made going into the process? And how are we sharing those learnings to organizations that um, and, and funders who are on similar journeys or maybe are even like surpassed us, right? I think that to, we're not the first folks to ever think about youth engagement, right? Um, but but I do think it's important that we are really honest and transparent around what it, what it takes from a program officer level all the way up to the vision from the president of the foundation. I'm really fortunate that when Lisa Hamilton, our new president in 2020 unra unraveled her um, strategic direction Thrive by 25, youth leadership was a piece of that. And that trickled down throughout the entire foundation. Um, and so 
what does it take for our foundations to to kind of shift our investments and in thinking? Um, it, there, there's a multi-layer process, um, and I want to be able to share um, alongside of my colleagues in the foundation. Again, like all of our our portfolios, it, it shows up differently in. Um, but I'm I'm really excited to share what it looked like. This the, particularly this collaborative approach looked like, and, and how long it took, and what it took. The grace of our director and our, our um, vice president and our internal team that supports this work. Um, it is not just me at the foundation and it does take a lot of capacity, but what are some of the great results that come out of it? That answer was wonderful. Um, we, can, we can head to the, um, um, an, organization, an organization just beginning this journey with a plan and intentionality versus an organization that has been in this work. How are the metrics measured? Are they different? That was a big one. So we're talking about veterans versus rookies, basically, right? At the foundation, no, they, they aren't measured differently. Um, I'll say that. I, I think that it is what Libby talked about, that figure eight. I don't think that anybody ever gets it completely right. It's always like an iterative process. And so it's hard for me to imagine that there is an organization that is not always in some sort of change process to be better. Um, so I don't know. What, I, I'd be interested to hear your answers um, from the from the pure metrics standpoint, um, there are things that you may build on, like, okay, now that you have young people that are on staff, what does it look like to have young people on the board? If that's a goal of yours, there's some people that that's not the goal. I think it really is about what folks are ready for um, and, and what, what, their, what their goals are as well. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. That's what I was gonna mention too, less about the specific metrics, but the intent with the tool is that you come as you are. And so that you can see yourself in the toolkit, whether you've been doing this for 10 years or you're brand new and you're starting. And that um, there are kind of these core principles that will weave its way through, but they have to look different in your environment. Otherwise we're not doing the work. So I know Mahal had mentioned like, cookie cutter models don't work. We're not gonna give you a checklist that says, do this, then this, then this, then this. But the whole intent is that we're doing some deep reflection with the tool. We're acknowledging where we are either as organizations or as practitioners or participants or whatever that is that you're coming to the toolkit with um, to be able to do that. And so I think a question we get into a little, it gets a little funny when we talk about like standard metrics across the board, because I would challenge us that says, that's not gonna move the needle. What's gonna move the needle is that deep reflection and the intentionality about how everybody can use the tool. Maybe the tool looks, you know, is like physically looks the same or you're watching the same video, but it's gonna have a different impact. Um, and I would challenge us that our metrics need to be individual by site, by community, um, and by organizations. And I'm and I and I think the intent and hopefully what we'll pull through is is tools to help you do that. Yeah, I think um, part of this process, and I think Tracy's gonna speak more about this later, is like us truly getting to know each site and um, I think creating those metrics together. because um, I don't think we could put one on any or any group. We need to create it together. Mm -hmm. Look at Mahal teeing me up so perfectly. You didn't even know it. Um, I want to close out today's panel, but I don't go anywhere because I do want there's an invitation to join us. Um, so thank you to Libby and Nisi and Rashad and Mahal and Milana and Tyler for joining us this evening. Um, I really appreciate, I know everybody on the call does too, just your, your different perspectives. And of course, like as a, as a colleague um, of you all, just I'm always in awe of, of not just the energy that you bring, but the expertise and the vibe um, is always, always amazing when I'm um, with you guys. So thank you so much. Um, I do want to move us to what's next for the collaborative. And what is next is, Phase two, where we are going to be testing out the toolkit. Um, I kind of, spoiler alert, mentioned it earlier, but I will share my screen really quickly. 
Um, we are in the process of recruiting. Um, oh, oh, what happened? What happened to it? There it is. Um, to uh, recruiting four different grantees um, with advanced experience in youth adult partnerships that are looking to launch and or deepen youth engagement or intergenerational engagement strategies within a larger community change initiative. So that sounds very convoluted. What it basically means is that an organization that already kind of like is working with young people, understands the basic principles as in embodying the basic principles of youth adult, partner, part, uh, youth adult partnerships within their own organization, but they may wanna work with another community partner. So they want, might wanna work with the library system or they may wanna work with a mayor's office or they may wanna work with the housing authority to bring an intergenerational um, approach to an existing adult partnership. We're looking for four different grantees, <laughs> excuse me, or communities that are willing to pilot our toolkit to receive technical assistance um, from Bridges as a part of that and participate in a learning community. Um, we are going to be launching a letter of interest um, um, invitation that is for everyone in the United States of America. You can apply to be a part of this. After we um, um, have the letter of interest, we will select probably around 15 to 20 organizations that will fill out a, a full proposal. By, I want to say Friday, um, if not Friday, Monday, we will drop that information as far as the letter of interest goes. By June 2023, we will select the grantees and then we will start um, the planning process. So we're gonna spend the rest of 2023 um, in deep partnership with community. We're gonna come out and do some site visits. We're going to start our learning community. We're gonna work with local partners, figure out the plan, adapt the toolkit to local need. And then we launch the toolkit in January, 2020. Four. The toolkit will probably launch between 18 and 24 months, and then we'll have a different process by which we will collect um, like ongoing feedback throughout the two, 18 to 24 month process, and then um, we will be working internally to, um, to amplify and scale the toolkit based on what the implementation findings are. And so, again, we are looking for four grantees um, nationwide call for um, letters of interest for folks that were, are interested in piloting specifically this Casey, um, Casey toolkit. Um, the funding uh, for the toolkit the first year um, being like the planning year is $75,000 and it's gonna be up to $100,000 for the additional two years. So total range of, um, what's that? up to $275,000 for the three year or actually two and a half year period. Um, I'm going to, everybody who's on this call and register for the um, this today's session will get a, a um, alert to your emails um, that will have the directions for um, the letter of interest. So don't, if you're a part of this call, you will, you will don't have to worry about following up. You will automatically get it when it comes out on Friday and or Monday, uh, or Monday, not and or, but Monday. Um, and if you wanna share it, please feel free to share it far and wide. Um, outside of just this particular project, there are other projects that are um, happening across the foundation. And I'm looking at this as not just this particular project, but like a landscape analysis of the types of work and um, that folks are doing um, across the nation and how they're kind of looking at youth adult partnerships and trying to for lack of a better term, infiltrate <laughs> adult spaces and make them more youth friendly um, and leveraging youth voice um, and, and sharing that decision making um, and making sure that young people have a meaningful contribution to the solutions that they are creating. So um, I will welcome everyone on this call to apply and to share uh, the funding opportunity. I know Casey does not often do open calls for proposals, a letter of interest. And so I'm excited to see um, who responds um, and excited to, to be a steward of that process and lead that process for the foundation. If you have any questions about the project, um, please feel free. Um, Karen, um, we if you registered, we have your email um, on the um, through the registration link. 
I'm going to drop my email because it's not tbrody at um, acf.org. It's not that. So I will drop my email in the chat if you have any questions. Um, it's T calendar, but calendar is spelled differently. So just check the chat. Um, if you have any questions based on today's conversation, please feel free to reach out. I'll be more than happy to, um, to chat with you offline. Okay. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, I will spell it out. It's T-C-A-L-L-E-N-D-E-R at AECF.org. Once again, that's T-C-A-L-L-E-N-D-E-R at AECF.org. All right. Thanks everybody.